And so um, my name is Yvette McCarter and I direct the um, Clinical Microbiology Laboratory at UF Health in Jacksonville, Florida. And um, I also for about 15 years was the Associate Program Director for our Pathology Residency Program. So I know that you all are um, excited about uh, taking your exams, finishing up, and obviously learning about microbiology today. So let's start talking about a bug's life, right? So the, for the next two hours, we're gonna be talking about bacteriology and we'll start with a question, right? So which of the following is the optimal specimen for the diagnosis of infective endocarditis? Is it a single 50 ml central venous line sample for culture? A paired peripheral blood culture drawn from the same site? Three peripheral blood cultures drawn every 24 hours? or three peripheral blood cultures collected over a 24 hour period. Hopefully you're hazarding a guess. Oh, I'm seeing lots of Ds pop up. Okay, you all are fabulous. And that is correct. So let's start, if we're gonna be talking about a bug's life, we're gonna start from the beginning. So for us in microbiology, specimen collection and transport is pretty much everything. You probably have heard it before, garbage in, garbage out, right? So the first thing that we wanna make sure of is that we get the correct site, right? Correct anatomic site for the infection that we're trying to diagnose, minimizing contamination. If we're not gonna be collecting something like tissues and fluids, which are obviously the most fabulous specimen, we definitely need to make sure that the container that the specimen is transported in is appropriate for what we're doing. For instance, if we're collecting urine, we really should be putting it in some kind of a preservative transport container to make sure that it doesn't overgrow during transport. If we're using swabs, we need to make sure we're using the right swabs with the right transport medium. In addition to the site and the container, volume is also important, right? So blood cultures, especially three sets, 20 mLs per set collected over a 24 hour period is optimal. And you might say, well, at my hospital, they pretty much just do two. And that's what most people do. But if you look in the literature, the highest recovery is with three sets over a 24 hour period. Also, again, volume is gonna be important. Dr. Sandin may have addressed this when he talked about AFB this morning, that especially with fluids and tissues for AFB, we always want more, right? More is better. And it's true for pretty much everything. If you think about swabs, we'll look at some swab pictures in just a second. Swabs are pretty small, right? They don't collect very much. So it's always better to encourage surgeons, especially to collect tissues and fluids. So just some examples of specimen collection and transport containers, right? Um, the one here in the middle of the e-swab is the now preferred swab. It's actually a locked swab, got to say that very carefully, as opposed to a, a wound swab, so as opposed to like a Q-tip type swab, that actually is much better at um, not only collecting the specimen, but actually releasing the specimen into the transport media that you see here. So once we've collected the bugs, right, we have a specimen, we have to be able to see them, right? How do we do that? Well, obviously, we know the mainstay of, of microbiology is the gram stain, right? Not only do we use it for direct specimens, but we're also gonna use it to kind of pretty much talk about everything else in bacteriology today because all of the organisms are broken down essentially by their gram reaction. Fixation is important, right? So methanol fixation, definitely better than heat fixation because it preserves not only the bacteria, but the host cells better. Crystal violet is our primary stain with Graham's iodine as being the mordant. The decolorizer is probably the most important part of the process. You wanna use uh, equal amounts of acetone alcohol to get the perfect decolorization. And safranin usually used as the counter stain, although you can use something like carbon fusion as a counter stain. So with the primary stain, gram-positive organisms, those with a really thick peptidoglycan cell, cell wall will absorb the crystal violet and the iodine and it will not be decolorized. Organisms that have a very thin peptidoglycan layer, gram-negative organisms, will have the crystal violet basically washed away by the decolorizer along with lipids and then are stained, are stained with the secondary stain. So that's how we get our differential um, stain. 
So gram staining is still one of the least expensive, I think most important tests that we can do in microbiology. Um, it gives us a lot of information about the specimen quality, right? We know that respiratory specimens that have a large number of squamous epithelial cells shouldn't be cultured. Many people actually also don't culture wound specimens that have excess of squamous epithelial cells. It also allows us to evaluate the bacterial morphotypes on oil immersion, right? And it's really important for determining presumptive identifications of likely pathogens. How do we tell if we've stained the slide well? If we have host cells on there, they should be pink. And if they're blue, then we've under decolorized a little bit. And so you want to stay away from the blue areas if you ever have to interpret a gram stain. So this just shows you the good and the bad, right? So uh, neutrophils on the left, squamous epithelial cells on the right. And you may say, well, okay, so we have some squamous cells there. What difference does it really make? You can see in the lower portion of the right hand uh, side of the slide, that's a close up of a squamous epithelial cell with lots of, let's say it's a respiratory specimen, upper respiratory bacteria, normal resident bacteria. That's also gonna grow in the culture if we culture it, right? And so because culture is theoretically very sensitive, we wanna make sure that we're culturing a specimen that, that is representative of a site of infection rather than mostly contamination. What else can we do besides gram stain? Um, some people still use methylene blue stain to detect neutrophils in stool specimens to determine inflammatory versus non-inflammatory diarrhea. Um, you can use methylene blue as well, not used in so many labs anymore, uh, to detect the metachromatic granules of Cranobacterium diphtheriae. You can also use the Wason stain to detect the bipolar staining of Ursinia pestis. Um, other thing, important thing to remember is you can sometimes see bipolar staining in the gram stain with enteric gram negative rods. That is not necessarily indicative of Ursinia pestis. Other enteric organisms, including things like E. coli, will also demonstrate that bipolar staining, at least on gram stain. Some laboratories also use acridine orange. Um, this basically can tell you morphology, so you can see cocci versus rods. This allows, most people use this for detecting organisms um, when they have gram stain negative blood cultures. So a uh, blood culture comes off positive, I do a gram stain, it's negative. The acridine orange actually intercalates into the nucleic acid and fluoresces. Um, so you can get an idea of organism morphology, not necessarily gram reaction, obviously, because it's not a gram stain, but it is helpful if we're picking up um, gram stain negative blood cultures that are in fact positive. You've already heard hopefully about the modified Kenyan stain. This is most useful for things like nocardia, right? The modification obviously is instead of using the 3% um, acid alcohol decolorizer that we use for tr traditional mycobacteria, we're using 1% sulfuric acid as the decolorizer. Okay, so we've collected our specimen We've done our, our smear on it. Now we need to be able to grow it, right? And so let's talk a little, for just a couple of minutes about media, right? So remember we have our blood auger, right? Usually contains 5% sheep blood. This is kind of our general purpose media, detect, able to detect most aerobic and facultatively anaerobic organisms used to process most specimens in microbiology. We also have enriched media that includes chocolate auger, unfortunately not made of chocolate, um, that allows your more fastidious organisms, things like some of your Haemophilus species, Neisseria, especially your pathogenic Neisseria, to grow due to the presence of extra nutrients. Historically, chocolate auger was prepared by actually adding the blood to the auger when it was very, very hot. And so basically the red cells would lice and release all the nutrients. Now we use a chocolate auger base instead of doing it kind of the old fashioned way. We can also make media selective by adding either, um, you know, some kind of additive, like usually a carbohydrate or other biochemical um, that tells us something about that organism, right? Or, sorry, that's differential. Selective, something that um, differentiates one organism from another, right? So if we think about our gram negative selective media like McConkie auger, 
like uh, XLD auger here, also hectoin, some of the others as well. Um, we've added things that inhibit gram-positive organisms and allow gram-negative organisms to grow. So example here, the hectoin auger again, um, but you can also make that, that selective media differential, right? So by looking at it on this hectoin, I can tell that there are two different organisms by their color, right? So here we've added the carbohydrate or a substrate or a biochemical. Also, the chromogenic media is based on that as well, chromogenic substrates that basically turn different organisms different colors. And the chromogenic media is actually really nice because unlike some of the other media that we use, the chromogenic media is definitive for that particular organism. So if we wanted to look for MRSA or other organisms like that, if it turned the appropriate color after the appropriate amount of time and had the typical colony morphology, we could say that that organism was in fact MRSA. Interestingly, if you think about it, blood auger is actually differential as well. When we talk about the streps today, um, we'll talk about the different types of hemolysis, right? And so in that, in that regard, blood auger is differential for helping us to differentiate amongst the streptococci. We also have lots of specialized media. We'll be talking about some of the different ones like the buffered charcoal yeast extract and the Reagan low media when we talk about particular organisms. A lot of our anaerobic media is also specialized. And then we also have specialized media for, for, for performing susceptibility testing like mueller hinton auger. So the idea behind this is that it does have a particular use rather than the general purpose use for processing specimens, which is the other media that we've talked about. 